Welcome to a brief history of the Thor Delta family of rockets, detailing the evolution of the recently retired Delta II rocket from its ancestor to Thor Abel through five decades of development. I decided to do this video in commemoration of Delta II's last flight, which ends the last American family of large rockets who emerged from the 1950s and 60s with the operational Delta IV, not a Thor rocket, the current Atlas V not related to the original Atlas family, and both the Titan and Saturn lines definitively out of service. The keen-eyed of you will have noticed that the rocket we are watching is not a Thor, but is instead a Vanguard rocket. Vanguard had a horrible record of three successes and 11 tries, but it is where the story of the Thor Delta line starts because the second and third stages of Vanguard get placed on top of a Thor ballistic missile to turn it into an orbital launch vehicle. The reason to use these upper stages lies in the second stage, at this point called Able, and its AJ-10-37 engine. The Able stage was the first liquid-fueled stage to ignite in flight, with both the Atlas rockets and the Soviet R-7 rockets deliberately avoiding this by using boosters. So until America developed a new stage with the same capability, the Agena, Able was it if the Thor rocket was to launch something heavier than a Vanguard or Explorer 1 probe. Thor was much lighter than an Atlas rocket and puny compared to an R-7 so it needed a liquid fuel engine for a second stage to get efficiency. And so that's why the Thor Able looked like this when it launched Pioneer 1. It was a 2.44 meter first stage named Thor DM-18 that had an MB3-1 engine burning kerosene and oxygen for 667 kN of sea level thrust, topped by a pencil thin second and third stage. The third stage was an Altair sod rocket motor and the second stage had to spin stabilize it before its separation and ignition after a coast to apoapsis. At this point, the Altair SRB was also called Grand Central, and it also had various other names. This was the Thor Able 1 rocket as launched 60 years ago. The 2.44 meter diameter for the first stage would be consistent throughout the development of the Thor Delta family. By 1959, the Thor Able 2 featured the first upgrade, a slightly more efficient Able stage, boosting specific impulse from 266 seconds to 270 seconds with the AJ-10-101A, and a much improved third stage, the Altair 1A, which had 254 seconds ISB compared to 229 seconds in the original. The better efficiency meant bigger payloads, and that meant a bigger fairing, as for this launch of Explorer 6, and so we get what I refer to as the electric toothbrush fairing. At this point, the Able stage was burning unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine and white fuming nitric acid. Eventually, in the 1960s, this would change to inhibited red fuming nitric acid, and later a combination of aerazine and nitrogen tetroxide. By 1960, there was an alternative though, the Thor Able Star. The Thor stage got an upgraded thrust of 734 kilonewtons and it needed less of an adapter because the Able Star stage was not thin. It was 1.52 meters. The Able Star didn't carry a third stage. Its AJ-10-104 engine had a 278 second ISP and burned three times as long as the Able stage. The Thor Able Star was used to launch Transit 1B. But the Able Star stage didn't really catch on just yet. Over on the Able stage side, they replaced the engine with the AJ-10-118, which could restart, and called the new restartable stage Delta. The Thor Delta was used to launch Echo-1, Oso-1, Aerial-1, and Telstar-1. In 1962, the Delta stage was combined with the upgraded DM-21 Thor from the Thor Able Star to make the Delta-A. It made just two launches before they upgraded the Delta engine to an AJ-10-118D with the red fuming nitric acid. This got 272 seconds ISP, burned for nearly three minutes, and carried the first attempts at a geostationary satellite, SYNCOM-1 and 2. That was Delta B. Then Delta C upgraded the third stage SRB to Altair 2A, and Delta C1 had an Altair 3. In 1964, Delta D became the first rocket to launch something into geostationary orbit, SYNCOM-3, but it did so with three Castor-1 boosters strapped to the side of it. The Castor-1 was the second stage of the tiny Scout rocket. These Castor-1As had 258 kN of maximum thrust, but only for 27 seconds, and with really low specific impulse. 
To handle the addition of boosters, the Thor stage had to be strengthened, so the Delta D's core was called a Thrust Augmented Thor, and all Thors with boosters are presumably Thrust Augmented Thors too. In 1965, they came up with a Thrust Augmented Improved Thor, also known by the designation DSV-2C. This had an MB3-3 engine. The MB3 was also called LR-79 by the Air Force, by the way, and was adapted on the Saturn I as the H1 engine. That'll come back later. The MB3-3 had 756 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level, and a 149 second burn time with a sea level ISP of 250 seconds. The thrust augmented improved Thor was used on the Delta E's, which also upgraded its three boosters to Caster 2, and featured the reintroduction of the Able Star tank. Now that with the boosters, the Delta E could have both the bigger tank and an Altair to a third stage. The engine on the second stage was the AJ 10 118E. By this time, with its restart capability, the AJ-10 was being used for everything. It was the Apollo service module engine as AJ-10-137. It would be the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system as AJ-10-190. And even today, it is still being used as the Orion service module engine. But still, there was competition from the Agena stage. I'm not covering Thor Agena or any of the other non-able slash Delta Thor rockets here, but they were also a thing. After Delta E, which launched Pioneer 6, and Delta E1 with an Altair 3 stage, which launched Pioneer 7 through 9, there was no Delta F. Delta F was actually the name of the second stage with an AJ-10-118F engine, and so the name wasn't used for a rocket. Uh, Delta G just left out the third stage and was only used for two launches, and there was no Delta H or I. Delta J was only used once and it was the first to use a completely different third stage, the much more efficient Star 37D. Which gets us to Delta L. Because there wasn't a Delta K rocket, Delta K would later be used as the name for the upper stage of the later Delta rockets, including Delta II. Delta L changed the shape of the Thor stage, making it 2.44 meters throughout, instead of tapering it at the top. This was called the Long Tank Thrust Augmented Thor, though it was an improved Thor as well because it had the MB3-3 engine as well. With the bigger tank, that engine had a 3 minute and 37 second burn time. Delta L still had an AJ-10-118E on the second stage and an Altair 3 on the third stage. Delta M switched out the Altair 3 with the more efficient Star 37D, while Delta N left off the third stage completely. Both Delta M and Delta N also came in six booster flavors, M6 and N6, where three boosters ignited on the ground and three were airlit. The rocket which launched Explorer 46, which you see here, was a Delta M6. Delta had been manufactured by Douglas Aircraft and in 1967, they merged with McDonnell Aircraft to form McDonnell Douglas. In 1972, McDonnell Douglas shifted the Delta family to the four-digit number designation system that would persist for the rest of Thor Delta history. The first digit would be the type of first stage and boosters. The second digit would be the number of boosters. The third digit was the type of second stage. And the final digit was the type of third stage. The Delta L's, M's, and N's with their long tank Thors got a zero for the first digit. Their second stages by this time were AJ-10-118F engines, which gave them a zero for the third digit. All that fluctuated was the number of boosters in the second digit and the type of final stage in the fourth digit. That fourth digit was either a zero for no third stage, like a Delta N, a three for the Star 37D, a four for the Star 37E, a five for the Star 48, and a 6 for the Star 37 FM. You will note that there was no option for an Altair SRB, so at long last that legacy of the Vanguard rocket had been retired. The rocket here is a Delta 0900 with Landsat 1 going into sun synchronous orbit from Vandenberg. Because they had started using 9 boosters, they decided to make the first stage tank longer, and this became the extended long tank thrust augmented Thor which would be the core tank for the 1000 series through the 5000 series, until the introduction of Delta II, which was the 6000 and 7000 series. The 1000 series had an MB3-3 as usual, 
but the 2000 series had an RS27 engine, which was an engine readapted from the H1 on the Saturn I. The 3000 series had the RS27 with improved caster 4 boosters. The 4000 series had the old MB3-3 engine with caster 4A boosters. And the 5000 series had the RS27 with the caster 4A boosters. So it's all mixing and matching the first stage, basically. On the second stage, the third digit in the designation, the zero was the old nitric acid AJ10-118F, but suddenly the AJ10's place was threatened by a newcomer, a refugee from the Saturn program. The lunar module descent engine had been simplified into a TR-201, and that was offered as a number one in the third digit. The rocket here is a Delta 2914 with the RS-27 and the TR-201 second stage. Is it really a Delta without the AJ-10? Well, it had about the same thrust as an AJ-10, but better efficiency, so they decided to use it until the AJ-10 made a comeback with the AJ-10-118K, the Delta K engine used for the rest of Delta's history, which switched to an aerosene and nitrogen tetroxide fuel mix like the TR-201 to match its efficiency. That new AJ-10 gets the number 2 in the third digit of the Delta numbering system, and on the 6000 series and 7000 series there's always a number 2 on that spot, so the Delta II always used the AJ-10-118K. During the 1980s, the introduction of the space shuttle gave people the notion that rockets like the Delta II would be redundant. The shuttle could carry three or four Delta payloads in one trip. In 1970, there had been 19 Thor launches, and the 1970s had an average of 12 per year. The 1980s, though, had half of that per year on average, and none in 1985 at all, when the shuttle program was ramping up its pace. But then the Challenger disaster happened in early 1986, and that grounded the shuttle fleet for years. The Defense Department needed its payloads launched in a timely manner, and funded a revamp in the other launcher lines, including Delta. This led to the first launch of Delta II on February 14, 1989 with Navstar 2-1, the first of the new generation of GPS satellites. This was a Delta 6925. The 6000 and 7000 series had extra extended long tank thrust augmented Thors, but the 6000s had an RS-27 with Castor 4A boosters, while the 7000 series had RS-27As with GEM-40 boosters. If a 7000 series rocket has heavy at the end of its name, it has GEM-46 boosters. The 7000 series would be the ultimate version of the Thor Delta line. Prior to Delta II, the Delta line had a share in smaller science missions, with some bright spots in the early Pioneer series, but it was overshadowed by the accomplishments of the Atlas and Titan lines. But the Delta II became the go-to launcher for a slew of major NASA exploration missions in the late 1990s and early 2000s, lofting near Schumacher, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Pathfinder, DSpace-1, Mars Climate Orbiter, Mars Polar Lander, Stardust, Mars Odyssey, WMAP, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, the Spitzer Space Telescope, Messenger, Deep Impact, Dawn, and the Kepler Space Telescope. This era was basically immediately in the wake of McDonnell Douglas's merger with Boeing in 1997, with Boeing looking to promote their newly purchased Delta rockets in competition with Lockheed Martin's Atlas and Titan launchers. The golden era for Delta II ended with the formation of United Launch Alliance in 2005. ULA was a cooperative venture between Boeing and Lockheed to save them from the trouble of competing and allowed them to drastically downsize. ULA focused on the more expensive Atlases and Delta IVs, Delta IVs having nothing to do with the Thor Delta line covered in this video, and reduced the number of Delta II launch sites as a precursor to closing the Delta II line down. The final launch of a Delta II, and of any rocket in the Thor Delta family, occurred on September 15, 2018, the launch of ISAT-2. It was the 100th consecutive successful Delta II launch. Thank you for watching this brief history of the evolution of the Delta rocket.